Well, welcome back to Open to Truth, a podcast all about exploring big ideas and discovering truth together. My name's Clint. Hey, I'm Tony. Welcome back. Uh, Just a touch of housekeeping at the beginning. Uh, We're going to be doing this from now on Mm -hmm. just because... Hey, most people listen to the beginning. We got you right now. Uh, <laughs> far more than the end, as it turns out, <laughs> which makes sense. I understand. Uh, so a couple ways that you can support the podcast is subscribing to our blog. Uh, that comes out every week. And just so you'll only get one email week and go to open to truth.com slash subscribe. If you like to read about ideas as well as listen, they're based on whatever that week's podcast is. So we release the podcast on Monday or Tuesday. Blog will come out Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, so just a nice little way to start your day, maybe kind of get the brain yeah, great. moving along. Or if you don't have time to listen to a podcast, but you still want to keep up with what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bite-sized read for you. And it's kind of a, what I like about it too, it's a good way to share with a friend instead mm-hmm. of like, just like, listen to this hour long conversation. Right. It's yeah. like a three minute thing. And then there's a link to our content yeah. uh, within the blog. So it's a good way to support what we're doing. Where do they go again? Uh, open to truth.com slash subscribe. Got it. Uh, and then also, we'd love to hear from you. So write into the show at mailbag at open to mm-hmm. uh, Questions, criticisms, comments, we'd love to just bring that up and do more mailbag episodes. Yeah, we want to interact with you. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And we'll talk about it here on the show. Yeah, it'd be great. And we'll even say your first name. If you're cool with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we could also come up with aliases right. if you prefer to remain Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lover of truth yeah, yeah. asks this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so today, I would really like to... Um, spend some time talking about the Bible. Mm -hmm. So often on this podcast, uh, I I just don't want anyone to get the wrong idea that we like mock or don't like scripture. So I think in one of the previous episodes, I had read out a passage and we kind of laughed about it. You read, you said from Deuteronomy that God detests a man who wears a woman's clothing. And part of that is like, we have a sense of humor, like the language of it can be funny to me. That's Uh, why I laughed a lot when I heard that. (laughs) Uh, And we didn't even get any comments about it. I'm just, I felt like, well, I just want to be clear that, uh, or even from our Brian Zond episode, we talked about the Bible at length Mm -hmm. and um, some nuances there. So, and I know a lot of our listeners, you guys, uh, are most of you are of the Christian persuasion Mm -hmm. and are maybe in a process of deconstruction and uh, wrestling with certain uh, dogmas that you were taught as a kid, but still have some kind of affinity or affection for scripture, you know, that held a, uh, you know, a significant place in your home and your faith community. And so just want to talk through some uh, yeah, just some ideas about the Bible, how to interact with it well, what it is, and awesome. uh, kind of name some problems that a lot of us find ourselves facing when we approach the scripture and maybe some solutions to those to those problems. That sounds awesome, dude. So one uh, that I hear pretty frequently is um, a distrust that the English translation that you possess mm-hmm accurately captures what the author of the biblical book intended to say yeah Um, well i've certainly run into this even from i mean i know folks who would rebuke you for using an niv version you should only use king james version sure yeah kjv only yeah there's one trustworthy translation that is sort of god approved Mm -hmm. yeah which i think maybe betrays a misunderstanding of what is a translation? How did we get these things? What what problem are they trying to solve that we need it to be translated, you know? Right, right. What are they even trying to do? So I think most of the listeners would know this, but I mean, the New Testament was written in Greek. Mm-hmm. Old Testament, you have Hebrew and Aramaic. And at some point, right, I mean, this makes sense, that it was written down by somebody or a, a group of editors. That so there, definitely there, happened. There was a moment in time where someone put pen to paper for the first time communicating these ideas, mm-hmm. okay? Now, what stinks is that we don't have any of those. No. Any of the original uh, scribblings are... They're just lost to history. They're lost to time. Yeah. It could it could turn out that they're found. That That's not... Outside of the sure, realm they of found possibility. those Dead Sea Scrolls. Found Dead Sea uh, Scrolls. Yep. Um, but yeah, I think those were dated. Uh, forgive my ignorance, but those like, weren't original manuscripts, though. No, no. Even the Dead Sea Scrolls, yeah. they're just old copies. Right. Yeah. I think of Old Testament 
mm-hmm. passages yeah. dating back to like in the 400s maybe BC. Could be know. totally off there, but yeah. they're super old and it's cool that we found those. Mm-hmm. Um, so what happened, What so these were written down at some point and then like uh, by that I mean the scriptures mm-hmm. that are in your, you know, yeah. canonical English version. Yeah. And at various times, like someone thought, hey, it'd be really great if other people could read this too. So they copied it down. Yeah, there was so no printing press. Whatever happened to that original had it was copied. Maybe by that same guy. Like mm-hmm. he, maybe he made. Let a me bunch write of another one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and eventually, other people got involved with that process of copying, and those are called like maybe secondary manuscripts. And so, you know, there's a bunch of those. I think we have like over twenty thousand of those things. But again. They could be all the way from when they were written, mm-hmm. not many of those, if at all, mm-hmm. to up until now, like in a, you know, yep. different copies. So a lot of them fall in the medieval age, some of them earlier and in different languages. So when are modern scholars who are trying to figure this stuff out go to make your English version of the Bible? Uh, they have a what's called a textual apparatus, and they can see. Uh, they've learned to. D- there's a whole code to it that's super confusing, but they're trained to look at that and see which manuscripts, which of those copies contain different variants. Mm-hmm. So, as you might guess, in the copying process over thousands of years, mistakes were made. Not or only changes. Mis- changes. Not only mistakes. I can imagine deliberate changes being made Mm -hmm. not to get all conspiracy theory or whatever but i can imagine that happening but Uh you're saying there's a way in which scholars can compare the whole canvas of manuscripts let's take one particular passage genesis 1 and there are twenty thousand copies of this thing genesis 1 and some of them have slightly different language Mm -hmm. but if we overlap all of them we can piece together like almost average them out and piece together here's what they're all aiming at is that what you're saying uh i mean that that last part you gave like a a strategy then of what to do with it which was averaging out and that's not always what's done (laughs) sure (laughs) hey i'm no scholar (laughs) yeah yeah um so here's kind of so this is called textual criticism Mm -hmm. and here's the rub here's the main reason why sometimes your bible says different stuff uh there's two main reasons textual and linguistic the textual reason is that there's two main traditions of manuscript copying. One is the Masoretic text. You may have heard that before Mm -hmm. uh, if you're a little nerdy and into this stuff. And that is like copies of the Hebrew manuscripts. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with that is most of the extant or existing copies that we have are all from, or they're pretty late, like late medieval times. That's late. That's very late, Yeah. given that they were written in the BC. Yeah. These are late AD copies, yeah. most of them. Now, but that's it's what's nice about it is that it was a tradition theoretically passed on from that long time ago. Mm-hmm. Um, original Hebrew. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Conversely, there's a Greek tradition from the Septuagint, the Greek translation. This is for Old Testament. Uh sorry, both of these things. Yeah. And so the the Greek translation of that, the Septuagint, um, we have some pretty early documents, uh, like in the church father age, like 200 to 400 AD. Um, but it's not of that original language. So there's a constant debate going on in textual criticism and what to then use as what we're going to translate into English. Yeah. What is that, that bedrock meat that we're going to translate? Am I going to go with the Masoretic or the Greek uh, Septuagint tradition? And the whole debate is not necessarily an averaging out, but the main strategy is uh, which of the variants, that just means a difference between the manuscripts, is the result of a scribal error or deliberate. Like ty- cons- typo. Or, oh, yeah. okay. You're including that. Uh, or is it faithful to the original? Mm. That is the crux of the debate. Yeah. And they have they go to school for a long time to think about reasons for making those decisions. Yeah, yeah. So, sorry if that was kind of confusing or a mouthful, but that's why uh, different translations will have sometimes really different looking passages. So, here, here's an example. Uh, let me pull out uh, this book. It's called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by yeah. Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart. Yep. yep. Handy little tool. Mm-hmm. 
and one of the opening chapters is about translation and they give this great example of how the translations will appear differently mm. now we've just talked about the textual difference like those uh manuscript traditions yeah we'll get to the other bit in a second but here is first corinthians seven thirty six. this is a verse in the bible hit me and i'm going to read you four different translations okay and are no- these sorry are these modern translations these are modern translations. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll name them as I go. Mm-hmm. So the New King James Version. If any man thinks that he is behaving improperly toward his virgin. This is just the start of a sentence. Okay. Mm-hmm. Wow. The New American Standard, NASB. If any man thinks that he is acting unbecomingly toward his virgin daughter. Different. TNIV. If anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorably toward the virgin he is engaged to. Oh, my word. Oh, my gosh. N-E-B. If a man has a partner in celibacy and feels that he is not behaving properly towards her. Wow. So the first one just says virgin. And so that's an updated version of the KJV that is following that Masoretic Hebrew manuscript late. Like these were recent manuscripts. Mm -hmm tradition okay and everyone all these other tradition uh translations came along and said well what does that mean what virgin like what's the relationship Mm -hmm. so we have daughter virgin he's engaged to and partner in celibacy so the all three of those are giving a different a very different picture different meaning yeah and we can get to we've talked about inspiration and we will continue to talk about it on other podcasts but for those that are um, wanting to cling to maybe a more conservative notion of inspiration, it's like, well, which one is it? Yeah, you're so, I, yeah. Technically, like the Chicago statement on biblical inerrancy and inspiration would say, like, God inspired the original manuscript, which we which, don't have, which none of these are that I just read, and we don't have any of those. But which one of these is most faithful to that inspired thing? Well, it's tough. They're all saying different things. Yeah. So which one is it? And they presumably they all have good reasons for their differences. Mm-hmm. These aren't just arbitrary nope. choices. These okay. are interpreters trying to do their best to convey in English an idea which was not originally put forth in English. Right. Right? Yep, that's right. Yeah. Um, Man. So... That's just to illustrate, and you could. There's like hundreds and hundreds of examples of just how about these any verse. Look basically, di- pretty different. Yeah. Um, so we looked at the ways that textual criticism could lead to having a different English sentence in different translations of the Bible. Yeah. Now maybe a more interesting um, and easier to understand difference is the linguistic side, and this is probably what most people think of when they think of translation. Uh, so once you've decided what um, base manuscript that's from the different language to use, mm-hmm. well, now uh, what does that say in English? Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because this is a different language. How am I going to translate it into one that people can actually read and understand? Yeah. Well, I mean, well, there's mm-hmm. there's already even even today using Google Translate. Like I went to Mexico mm-hmm. last year. Maybe two years ago, Melissa and I went to Mexico. Not during COVID. No, no. And everyone says last year and they mean 2019. That's that's what I meant. No, everyone's. I did mean 2019. (laughs) We're all goofed up. Yeah. But I went there and I used, I had Google Translate on my phone and I was really trying to like, I wanted to interact with my waiters and whatnot in their language. It wasn't working. (laughs) It's just tough the way you can miscommunicate. Even today, with today's technology, with a completely robust understanding of Mm -hmm. Spanish and English. There's a guy right there that can tell you what he means. Yes. Sadly, we we don't have that for the the Bible. So how much greater is the challenge of taking an ancient text written in another language, language itself evolves over time, Mm -hmm. And then translating it to modern 2021 day yeah. English. What's super handy is that there are other, uh, again, we don't have many original manuscripts of any of this stuff, even yeah. um, non-biblical just writings at the time that the Bible was written, Yeah, extra biblical. Mm-hmm. And what's, what's handy, though, is that when we do have those manuscripts of other writings to compare when the Greek words are used mm-hmm. and you can see like, contextually how was that word used in that day in that culture exactly yeah. that's really helpful when that happens mm-hmm. but there are a bunch of 
words in scripture that have we have yet to find them. We don't know. Uh, like elsewhere. Uh, what am I thinking of? Theopneustos. The oh yeah. God breathed. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's been a huge thing for the doctrine of inspiration. <laughs> Paul you can't made find that word it. up. You can't for find all intents it and purposes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's just challenges like that. But the the big linguistic debate that goes on in translation slash interpretation efforts, we can explore that mm. more in a moment, but is the difference between formal equivalence and functional equivalence. So what that means is one school of thought wants to preserve the form, meaning the word order, the grammar, uh, and is doing like if I see a word there, I'm gonna pick an English word. Yeah. For the most part. A the, one for one, word for word, as best I can. Yeah. Which matches up best to one of our current words. Man, okay. The, the functional view says, okay, while trying to be as faithful as I can to the form, I need to communicate to a modern reader the meaning that the original author intended with this string of characters. Okay. Yeah. And remember, uh, there's no spaces or barely any punctuation in any of this stuff. Yeah. It's mind-boggling how these guys do it, but they they figured it out. And so they're trying to, yeah, put it in words that make sense in modern English and promote readability and understandability. Yeah. Are you saying there is a an ongoing debate about those two strategies and which one is best? Well, yeah. But, I mean, you were saying that KJV... KJV only. Yeah. And part of that is motivated by uh, in twofold. We like the Masoretic Hebrew tradition and its formal equivalence. Right. Like this is the word of God. Here are the words. And now we're make, just putting it into the English words. Yeah. Yeah. And the trouble is that that's hard to do because there are some notions that may not give a direct um, word for word. Yeah. So what's a good example, man? Um Maybe in reverse. So we might have many words in our language that connote that maybe they only had one word in that one right. or vice versa. So like we use like the different word, degrees of nuance. So so one uh, tricky part with the formal equivalent strategy is that certain words might carry um, a more robust, thick concept mm -hmm. than it would be in our language mm -hmm. so for instance let's just take the word agape yeah which you could just make the decision to call it love and that wouldn't be totally wrong i mean yeah and that might even have been uh sorry if this is confusing but um they they might have been just saying the word love but in their language with agape mm -hmm. but what that the meaning that that word carries sometimes we've said unconditional love yeah and so, well, when you go to translate it into the Bible, do you put down unconditional love? Yeah. Or do you just put love? Love. That's a tough choice. Uh, there's not an obvious. But if you're going answer. for a word for word, one word for then one just word. just put love. Put love. And mm -hmm. you miss out then on some of the richness of what's trying to be But conveyed. there's also other words for love in the Greek that carry different robust connotations. Mm -hmm. Eros, mm -hmm. you know, phileo, mm -hmm. romantic love and brotherly love, mm -hmm. let's say. And so, do you put those adjectives in to the English That's translation? Tough. You know? That's tough. I can also think about situations where, and maybe this is where you were going, but limitations of that formal equivalence would be like idioms. Absolutely. So, mm -hmm. we have an expression in English it's raining cats and dogs. And mm -hmm. you could translate in that into Japanese or Aramaic or Hebrew or whatever. But if they don't have that expression, like if they don't. If they're not familiar with what that means, that it's raining heavily, mm -hmm. then they will be... Con it's raining canines and felines. What? So That happened? You may recall some of our listeners as well. In the King James Version, there's a passage in 1 Corinthians 7, 1, a bunch of them from Corinthians, but <laughs> um, that it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, when you read that in English... I have a very distinct sense of what that means. It's Sometimes like, I think it is good for me to touch a woman. <laughs> but you think of it, uh, we can think of it very uh, literally and like spatially, yeah. touch a woman. Like, right. Don't touch, right? <laughs> uh, 
But to your point, you're like, well, actually, sometimes it is good to touch a woman. Yeah. Like if, if I'm if pushing I never her out of the way of a bus. Or if I never touched my wife. Yeah, yeah. That wouldn't be good. <laughs> Can I hug my mother? <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. So, but that's why it's so important. Like, well, when we studied extra biblical documents, we found out, oh, that's an idiom of the day to mean sexual intercourse. Right. So it's good for a man not to have sexual intercourse. And you're like, well, wait, I don't agree, Paul. Well, yeah. hold on. He's quoting probably a line from the letter that the Corinthian church sent him oh man to then respond to so we just we take something as the inspired word of god that paul is directing us to do when in fact you know like it was a specific well, yeah i mean there are no punctuation mark there were no quotes that they used back then it was from context yep. and so um yeah there's still a bit of debate about that but the the TNIV version says it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Mm. So they figured out that idiom. And then because the NIV uses the functional equivalent method, decided to put that into the English, even though that's not word for word at all. Now, it it seems pretty obvious to me that I would I would rather read a functional translation like. If I think about what what are we trying to do with writing or communication at all, mm-hmm. it seems to me, we've talked about this in previous episodes, I am I have some mental state, some idea, some concept, and I'm encoding it in symbols, and I'm lobbing it to you through writing, and then you are decoding it and hopefully arriving at the same mental state, the same idea mm-hmm. that I had when I first encoded. And it seems to me that the, the functional equivalence mode of translation would achieve that on a far more consistent basis than the formal equivalence Mm -hmm. strategy. Am I crazy? I don't think you're crazy. I think this speaks to uh, the question at the outset of this of people that going through deconstruction have an affinity for scripture, but don't know really what to do with it. Well, there's a couple, there's not just one way to use scripture. Mm -hmm. One would be to study it. And in that case, the recommendation would be to actually get different translations that specifically try to do this from the two different perspectives and maybe even other ones that are in between. Mm. So that would help me uh, in like trying to analyze what it is that the person, the biblical author initially said Mm -hmm. to compare both of them and learn more about it um, rather than just taking one for granted or assuming it. Well, but and on that, I can imagine there's almost no end to the amount of study you could do on any one particular passage. You could devote your entire life to scholarly study mm-hmm. to figure out every which way it's been translated, every little contextual nuance that might be they do. helpful. And people do, right? People yeah. do. There are, there are scholars on chapters of books you mm-hmm. know, or even passages. Yeah. The preeminent 1 Corinthians 14 scholar. Oh. You can really and specialize, so, huh? Uh, maybe this is too far afield, but mm-hmm. like wanting to be a faithful Christ follower, does it require that degree of scholarship? Surely, surely it can't that, that God set up the world in such a way that those who really want to follow him will devote their lives to the study, the intense scrutiny of Scripture, mm-hmm. especially because not everybody is capable of that. They don't either have the resources they right. don't have the mental faculties to do that. I know mm-hmm. I would bump up against my ceiling pretty quickly of like yeah. just how much I can tolerate. So the other thing is to use it as a spiritual formation tool. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't live my life for the sake of the Bible. I use, I live my life for the sake of the gospel or the mm-hmm. kingdom of God or um, uh, growing in my relationship with God or something. Yeah. And I can use scripture as a tool to do that. Mm-hmm. Um and I think we can get to that in a moment more, but just yeah. while we're in the study realm and just understanding which, if I am going to do that thing, mm-hmm. which Bible should I pick up and use? I agree that the functional equivalent is probably a better way to go. Mm. Um, but just other ways to to be on notice for, because you can't help as you read it, you're going to make certain assumptions about the meaning of a passage. Yeah. So another um, less uh, worrisome area, but still a thing, are measurements. Um, particularly ones that are relative. You're like, well, how is a measurement relative? There's lengths and heights. Yeah, but okay. what about a cubit? Uh, is that what, what you mean? Yeah, like the we can we did a lot of historical work and yeah, 
that's what a cubit is. Yeah. And so then you can transliterate to how many feet that is, and mm-hmm. that's fine. You know, let's let's do that instead of just putting cubits or ephods and whatever, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, or bushels. Yeah. But then what's tricky is particularly like um, monetary am- amounts mm. where there's inflation that has happened over time. And 300 so like, silver pieces. What is a talent, dude? Yeah. Who know. knows? Like you read the parable of the talents and how many youth group uh, messages have been preached where it's talking about like whether you're good at basketball or not. Yeah. Like your yeah. talent. Like, yeah. no, 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 no. That was a t- talenton is a Greek word a, for a, a very large sum. Yeah. And a denarius was about a living wage. Yeah. So it's a financial story. <laughs> how to translate that. Do you put do you say talent and denarii like the King James? Yeah. Well, that's not super helpful to someone who just wants to know what it means, the functional equivalent. Mm-hmm. But I could see why I'd want to know, like, well, how the formal side has its merits as well. Yeah. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, but, like, when <laughs> the trick is the moment you publish it, your English version, uh, the relative amount changes. So, right. for the day, like, uh, and the laborers in the vineyard, vineyard, the owner still gave everyone $100. Um, well, what's that communicating? And or gave everyone a thousand dollars. Yeah. You know, well, that's a lot to some people or maybe not very much. Or in 50 years, it might not be very much. Right. You know? yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So then do new do. So that's you as a uh, oh, you're on the, the committee to make the new translation. What do you do? Do you like check in with the World Bank and figure out what Go to the XE dot com and find the exchange rate? <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Um, so different issues like that. So yeah. the, new, the NIV. Uh, Call it like a thousand or what is it like 10,000 bags of gold or something? Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, that seems like a lot. Just leave it up to the reader to go Google it. Yeah, What's yeah. that worth today? Or just like something that would initially strike you as a lot. Oh, right, yeah. right, right. A bunch of bags of gold. That's pretty valuable. That sounds like a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the denarii is uh, 50 pieces of silver. Not as good That's as not that. As good as I'd prefer the gold. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that interesting? Um, yeah. Euphemisms similar to idioms. Mm-hmm. Um, so KJV would have something like, he forced her and lay with her. Wow. Well, we would just say raped yeah, that sounds now, like rape. and that's what the NIV chooses to do. Hmm. But it, um, particularly, so this is important for people that decide on a whim that they want to like, well, I want to know what the Greek says. And so they go to Blue Letter Bible, yep. and they look at it, and they're like, wait, wait a minute. This is what causes people to get disenchanted with the NIV is they don't know about formal and functional equivalent translation theories Mm. and strategies. And they look at it and they're like, there's like six words here. And I just see the word raped. Yeah. Like what's going on? What did they leave out? They make that decision. What did they cut out? He forced her and lay with her raped. There's a very different amount of characters. Yeah. What was that? Why did that happen? Well, this is why. So it's, it's helpful if you ever get a wild hair to go try to dig deeper, quote unquote, and look at, the greek you might get um upset that someone has left something out well and this just goes to i don't want to hijack you too much but i do want to underscore a point we sort of brushed by earlier which is Mm -hmm. that every translation is an interpretive effort it's it's somebody's or a committee's i guess attempt to interpret what the text is saying and then present it to you in modern day english and so I would just caution against this idea of, well, I just, I do what the Bible says, or I just, I look at the text and I, I just, that's the word of God. Just understand that mm-hmm. it is filtered through humans' best efforts, like, but efforts still to interpret that. Um, yeah. So here's, here's a really, what really interests me too about all this. And I, I know very little about it, but whenever I read things like this, I'm like, oh, that, it makes me, uh, desire to learn more about scripture and appreciate it more. Hmm. So here's an example of uh, wordplay. Great. So all the time in the prophets and Proverbs and Psalms, like these are meant to be in their original writing, like beautiful pieces of literature with a lot of similar conventions of mm-hmm. like it's poetry. Uh, callback references yeah. and rhyming. So, what happens here in Amos 8, 1 through 2? Um, you know I don't know that one by heart. I, yeah. Believe it or not. <laughs> it's okay. Um, there's these two words, kiss and kiss. Mm. And they're very similar. So as you were, I don't even know if I'm saying it right, but if you were to 
read that out in Hebrew, it would sound similar poetic or something. And the reader would make a connection between those, but they mean different things or alliterative. So here's what the formal equivalent says, uh, you know, the, the one for one, the more mm-hmm. literal God said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Kis is summer fruit of is summer. Then the Lord said to me, the end kiss has come upon my people, Israel. Mm. And it's not really obvious. Like, <laughs> yeah, man, you're not catching that distinction. Like what summer and end those two words in that passage are supposed to rhyme and communicate something, yeah, but you a, would, it's a pun. You or, would never get that. Yeah. But then, so they figure that out. And then the TNIV, what do you see, Amos? God asked. A basket of ripe fruit, I answered. Then the Lord said to me, the time is ripe for my people Israel. Yeah, to try to convey that same yep, poetic clever. Try to convey device. the same message, but they they butchered the word for word thing. Yeah. They abandoned that strategy. Forget summer and forget end. Yep. Ripeness. I is get what, that that's what the guy wrote. Yep. And it meant something to him. And I, what I care about is I want it to mean something for wow. people today. Mm-hmm. Um, there's other things too, to, to wonder man. about, like matters of gender. That comes mm-hmm. up all the time. I mean, the, it is written in a very originally very masculine mm-hmm. patriarchal society. So basically, everything says man, mankind. Yep. And do what you will with that. You can throw in women so but how do you do it that preserves readability you know yeah men and women and sometimes you just have to be careful because what if it is taught like it's an an instruction to men right the gender of men right right okay so that's the whole area of translation and that uh that has helped me think through like when i when i do go do those deeper searches in the greek i don't freak out that like i'm being miscommunicated to there's just different strategies afoot and I think knowing more about it will help you in your in your study and feeling more confident that when you pick up an English translation, uh, that at least for the functional equivalent, I'm I'm getting more at the meaning of what the biblical author said. Now let me push on you a little bit here because I know folks who would strongly resist a translation like say the message by Eugene Peterson Mm -hmm. which seems like it would be functional in its translation if you haven't read the message it's it's almost like a paraphrase it's yes sometimes it's called a free translation okay so it'd be the whole other end of the spectrum away from the formal yeah there's almost there's no no commitment no regard to the original word for word part just gonna try and capture the idea even if it might be not word by word, not sentence by sentence, maybe paragraph by paragraph or concept by concept. He's going to mm-hmm. try and convey that. Absolutely. So you'll even see like his verse markers. They're not they're not the same as in any other translation. He might have a chunk that's like, okay, this is verse 14 through 17, mm-hmm. kind of condensed into modern day English. Is there, why is there so much um, skepticism or distrust of a translation like the message? Like I've, I've heard people say, I'd never go to a church where the message is what they used to preach. Mm-hmm. Um, is it because is it because they maybe prefer this more formal equivalency, or is it that Eugene Peterson isn't a committee, and there's one? This is one guy. I don't know how he came up with this translation. Is this just Eugene's take on scripture? I think there's a lot of. If I can speak freely, you may. <laughs> oh, always on this podcast, mate. <laughs> just kidding. You're your just permission. discovering that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's a bunch of little principles and assumptions floating around in the cauldron. That's causing someone to react that way. Mm. One would be that you hear all the time. Well, I don't know about that. I just want to know what the Bible says. Yeah. It's like, okay, mate. <laughs> like that's what we're all trying to do. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is, uh, when you at any stage of this whole process, you're doing an interpretive act mm-hmm. that is trying to understand the meaning. And I would submit to you, even the act of The Apostle Paul writing the letter to the Corinthians. If you're committed to an idea of inspiration at all, that God was somehow involved in the development of Scripture, then uh, part of that means the Apostle Paul had an experience of God. Mm -hmm. uh, An idea came to him through divine inspiration. and And now Paul, as a person with free will and 
is fallible like anyone else. He's trying now, to translate that now in a sense. Now is in the position of interpreting that experience that he had. Mm-hmm. Um, unless you're just a straight up verbal dictation person on inspiration and and they audibly heard the voice of God telling them what to write down. I don't I don't see evidence for that, really, mm-hmm. uh, reason to think that. So I think people had an experience of the Holy Spirit having them to communicate an idea and they did their best to interpret that and, and write it to them to do so that. there is interpretation at the get-go of the original yep. manuscript let alone this whole interpretive what do greek words mean what do you how do you know that mm-hmm. like well a lot of people have spent a lot of time trying to do that or trying to understand the meaning mm-hmm. and so the message is just one extra attempt to do that mm. that is that one guy's interpretation mm-hmm. but don't think that if you pick up the niv that that's not an interpretation yeah, that you somehow right. got the pure word. Right. No, no. That's good, man. That was the interpretive effort of a committee. And you might trust that more, but again, they were different strategies too. Mm-hmm. You have to remember that. I mean, I'm sure there are there is a message-esque version. Maybe the Living Bible uh, is message-esque in its feel. Mm-hmm. And that was done by a committee, I'm pretty sure. I see. And not just a guy. Mm-hmm. Um, so when rubber meets the road, for somebody who wants to remain biblically faithful, go to the scriptures for wisdom, is the advice compare and contrast several translations as you read? Don't just read one translation. Uh, what what's best practice for a a Christian? For for what purpose? For understanding what scripture means. So I think it's best done in community with other people like what we're doing now mm-hmm. um and picking out a certain passage of a manageable amount and comparing different translations is a great start yeah um i don't know if and, and recognizing the different strategies that they came up with it uh, and sometimes it's not going to lead to drastically different answers but sometimes right. it will and you just have to check in with your own conscience and mm-hmm. and pray about it and and come mm-hmm. to a conclusion. I don't know if I do have a, a ready-made answer. No, that's that's fine. It's any better than that, but but some of this is as a result of the way history has unfolded and the challenges of language. Some of this is more gray than it is black and white. Yeah. So I don't know how maybe we've split this up into another ep- uh, for another time. I don't mm-hmm. know how long we've gone so far, but yeah. um, that was just one of the like six problems that I had listed. Oh my gosh. For <laughs> then yeah, let's do a series or something. Okay. Yeah. Um so again, this was we were trying to point out people that have an affinity, affection for the Bible, but they feel like oh, but I just don't know if I can trust it to be saying what the original author said. So let's just put a pin on like maybe mm-hmm. answer that more directly. Yeah. Um that is what the different translations are trying to do. So I get that they say different things. Mm-hmm. all over the place and but that's because of they've adopted different strategies for what to do with this underlying different language piece of paper that they're looking at um that was how do we get this manuscript from this whole tradition passed out from when that original guy wrote it and they copied it and they told their friends about it and other people copied it down and here we are today so what how do we find out what that original person said and i i don't feel like um I suffer from a grave sense of distrust. Do I think it's absolutely 100% there? I mean, no, mm-hmm. because the, I'm blocked by there's what's called historical distance. Mm. And we have these different strategies to try to bridge that gap, but none are going to be completely successful. Right. But again, what's so important is that that's not that's not something to undermine your faith or to think that God exists or that Jesus rose again from the dead right. or that God still speaks through the human heart today. Those are all different phenomena that you can have independent experiences of apart from scripture. Mm-hmm. Again, scripture, you can you can study it or you can use it as a spiritual formation tool to bring yourself into more of the likeness of Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So... I don't think that the differences that exist in our English translation in meaning from the original makes it so that you can't pursue that spiritual formation project. Right. That's great. 
Yeah. And we can speak more to what that could look like, how to use the Bible for spiritual formation Mm -hmm. and some of the other uh, problems that we face as people that are going through times of questions and uh, wrestling with our faith. So I love it, dude. Well, this will, this won't be the last conversation on this topic then. Cool. Sweet. Uh, well, thanks for listening to another episode of Open to Truth. We'd love to hear from you, as we said at the outset, mailbag at opentotruth.com. Uh, I react to, or not only do I react <laughs> in my soul, but also I will comment on any you comment you leave. respond as well. <laughs> on YouTube. And yeah. Uh, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. And any ideas for episodes? Like, sure. what, what are you going through? Like, yeah. what problem can we help solve or at least make a ex- one step toward or join you in asking shalom. questions. Yeah. 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 What burning question do you have that you aren't hearing people talk about or that you don't feel like you can ask people about that are in your life and nearby? Let us know because we'd love to interact with you. We don't promise to have answers. We never do promise to have answers, but we promise for this to be a safe place to ask questions mm. and talk about it. So thanks for watching. Uh, we'll see you next time. Stay curious. Stay curious.